My name is Joel Johnson. I'd like to welcome you to the Half Earth Project in Alabama at the Crossroads Biodiversity, Civil Rights and Science Education from the Black Belt to Paint Rock. I am joined today by the CEO and president and co-founder of the Half Earth Project and the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, Paula Ehrlich. We are looking forward to a great conversation today about the Half Earth Project in Alabama. And if you are joining us live, uh, or you will be joining us later through a recording, we would like to welcome you to the session. Senior Conservation Advisor Bill Finch is going to be joining us, as well as a number of committed partners in the Alabama region. Uh, our guests today also include Patient Knight with the Black, Forest, Black Rock Forest Research Center, and Philip Howard, who's representing the Alabama River Diversity Network. They will also be our guests in our conversation. Um, and here you'll also see just a couple of hashtags if you want to comment or share any of your thoughts uh, about today's session, please hashtag, hashtag Biodiversity Alabama and the Half Earth Project. If you have any difficulties uh, with your watching us on Zoom today, you can also uh, follow along on our live broadcast on Facebook. Just go to the uh, Facebook, open it up, search for the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, click on that page, and then select live, and you will be able to see the entire uh, event there as well. Okay, so going ahead to get started, let's talk a little bit about Alabama. Uh, first of all, Alabama is such a central location for biodiversity, civil rights, and cultural heritage. And our organization, the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, has deep roots there. Uh, the namesake founder of the foundation, E.O. Wilson, uh, lived in Mobile for many, many years um, and came up as a young naturalist in the Alabama River Delta Basin. And in many ways, it's the inspiration for the vision of the Half Earth Project and our work, the kind of the brain trust and launch pad that represents the big moonshot for our planet, this uh, powerful, wonderful, and transcendent idea of conserving half the land and seas to safeguard the bulk of biodiversity on Earth. I wanna take a moment just to briefly talk about E.O. Wilson and his connection to Alabama. Um, it's a many, many decades long relationship that is active right up to this very day. Um, as I said before, Dr. Wilson grew up in Mobile and it informed many of his, uh, much of his work. And just recently, Dr. Wilson donated all of his awards, including two of his Pulitzer Prizes and his National Science Medal Award to the University of Alabama as part of a gift supporting an endowment that will power a number of field studies done by students at the university. And in fact, also, E.O. Wilson, as a native son of Alabama, um, is constantly being honored. More recently, the Dauphin Island Sea Lab named a research vessel for him, the E.O. Wilson, which will go out um, and conduct a number of scientific studies uh, in marine protected areas and also areas of interest along the Gulf. All right. So what I'd like to do now is just take a moment to introduce um, Bill Finch, uh, who is going to be my guide uh, on this journey today. Uh, Bill Finch, as I said before, is our Senior Conservation Advisor and the Executive Director of the Paint Rock Forest Research Center. Um, Bill's gonna talk a little bit about the significance of Alabama, sort of writ large. And then we're gonna hear from our guests, Patience and Philip, who are both working in two very different areas in the state. And they're gonna talk about some of the similarities there and the differences and speak to some of their own work in protecting and safeguarding the biodiversity of Alabama. Later on, we're gonna hear from Dr. Ehrlich and she is gonna share with us what all of this conversation means for the Half Earth Park Project and also for our planet. And please feel free as we go through the conversation to use the Q&A function there to pose a question. 
uh, go ahead and write it. We probably will not be able to get to all of them, but we will definitely have a Q&A towards the end of this session, and we'll select some of those questions and, and point them to the, right, to the right person. So let's go ahead now and um, have Bill introduce yourself, and maybe you could ground us, Bill, in the bigger picture of Alabama as a seminal place for biodiversity. It's, uh, it's interesting that we, we love Alabama uh, because Ed grew up here. <laughs> We're interested in it because Ed grew up here. But it's important to understand that Alabama is not important simply because Ed grew up here. Uh, you know, it's important because Alabama, arguably more than just about any place else in the United States, maybe more places in the world, teaches us, teaches us about what diversity means. And I think that was very important to Ed's growing up. You know, Alabama, diversity means something in Alabama. It's important in Alabama. It's significant here in a lot of ways. It's, it's the most biologically diverse Eastern state. Uh, I think a lot of us don't realize that. Uh, there are only a couple of states with more diversity. Uh, it, it's the center of tree and aquatic diversity nationally. Uh, it's one of the great global centers of aquatic diversity. It's the center of turtle diversity in the Western hemisphere for heaven's sakes. And, and, and you know, if I can't impress you with that and all the other statistics, I have to tell you that we have a hundred species of crawfish. <laughs> we're, we're, the, we're the world's center of crawfish diversity. All of these things happen in Alabama. And Alabama, it's also important to understand that Alabama hadn't kept this diversity to itself. As climate has changed, Alabama has shared these species uh, with the rest of the country. That's been a real important mechanism. It's been a species producing machine that keeps sharing its diversity nationally and globally. And as climate changes again, Alabama is gonna be pretty important to how the rest of Eastern North America looks. But there's another way that diversity matters in Alabama. And, and, and we, need to, we need to make this connection because there's a reason Martin Luther King marched from Selma to Montgomery through the heart of Alabama along the Alabama River. It's not an accident. It's about the place. It's about the landscape. And in many ways, understanding this landscape, this place, this biodiversity, just to understand American history in a very significant way, but understanding how those two are linked Human diversity, biological diversity becomes very important to our mission, Emma. And that's why, you know, we've said we have a theme here in Alabama. We're seeing diversity through the eyes of diversity. We do that. Uh, we use, we apply that theme in a lot of different ways all throughout the state uh, in, in various ways. Um, in Paint Rock, uh, in the northeastern corner of the state, in an area uh, on a preserve that we worked with, with the Nature Conservancy, Paint Rock River Valley is 35, 60 miles long, actually, with, uh, with almost as much uh, acreage in the greater Paint Rock ecosystem as the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, a huge area, hugely, incredibly diverse. The river is probably, Paint Rock River is probably the, the most biologically uh, diverse river left in the Tennessee system, incredible uh, at its scale. Um, it's... Um, it's the center of deciduous forest diversity in North America. Uh, the Paint Rock Valley protects the center of cave life and diversity in North America. And that's why Stephen Hubble and some other scientists, Stephen Hubble from UCLA, and some other scientists approached us about setting up uh, a forest dynamics plot uh, that would help us to understand forest broadly here in Paint Rock. And we began that process more than a decade ago. Ed Wilson got involved and he said, that's fine. I like this idea. Forest dynamics is great, but I want you to understand if this doesn't become the woods hole, <laughs> those of you who understand what, where woods hole is in Massachusetts, if this doesn't become the woods hole of forest research, if this doesn't become the Scripps Howard of research, you're wasting your time. You need to make this a really important place for research. And so Ed got involved and we committed to that. We also committed to Ed that we would understand not just what's happening with trees, but through the whole ecosystem, from the thousands of species in the ground all the way up to the treetops. 
And so we began this process here. We also recognized that as we were looking for this diversity, we needed to see it through the eyes of diversity. So early on, we began a project with Alabama a and uh, historically black institution uh, here in the Tennessee Valley that's played a hugely important role in agriculture and forestry throughout the region. And we began a relationship with them to make sure we trained a new generation in the sciences that gave a new generation the ability to touch these ecosystems, to feel and be a part of these ecosystems and to do the real science and to make sure that this new generation reflected the full human diversity of North America. So we began that process and it's really fascinating. We got a great program. I'd love to talk about it all here, but I'm gonna let Patience Knight, who's been leading our crews in the field, talk a little bit about, uh, about how all that works. Patience? Welcome, Patience. Welcome. Uh, uh, so, Patience, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, you describe yourself as a wildlife technician. Uh, what is that? What do you, what do, you do? And, 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 you know, what are you doing in Paint Rock at the moment? Okay, um, I say I'm a wildlife technician and forestry technician because that is what we do. Uh, when I started at Alabama A&M in 2011, the first thing I started doing was small mammal and medium mammal uh, trapping in the Bankhead National Forest. And from then, you know, I've done uh, more work in streams, uh, water quality. Um, I've done more with wild pigs. That was actually my thesis work. And of course that incorporated habitat components, which made me appreciate more of the tree side of um, the forest. And so that's what's grown into my being the field coordinator at Alabama A&M for this Paint Rock Forest Dynamics project. And as the field coordinator, you work with a number of students from Alabama A&M as well and bring them out into the field. Can you tell me a little bit about how that, how that works and how the students get involved and what their day looks like? Okay, and um, like Bill said, it's part of the Paint Rock Forest Dynamics project that was written by Dr. Lubin Dimov. Uh, he moved to Vermont, and so Dr. Don Lemke has taken it over. But we like to bring out our students, but we also invite students from other institutions. And they come out here, and what they basically do is a tree inventory. So we get to teach them and train them in the forest science, which is something that might be lacking in their education about management, but maybe not the scientific part, the research part. But um, so they get to come out there, other opportunities to teach them other things and to mentor them in other things like the culture of the area, why the landscape looks like it, it does, um, wildlife moments, which are the most fun that we have out in the field. I could tell stories about that all day. Um, they come out and they actually, some people just want that experience of getting more comfortable out in nature because not all of us have that background. So they can really develop those connections um, this grant is multi-institutional, so we have a lot of people from a lot of different places, and um, they get to act, interact with them and with each other, and it's a way for them to build those connections amongst each other and amongst others in our field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and what are your, you know, hopes and aspirations for those students afterwards? What do they, what do they take away with them when that, that field work is done, what, and how do they carry that forward? I think a lot of the things they learn are the possibilities that you can have in this field, like, because people don't know about the things you can actually do. You can get paid and have a career in research. Um, you can do conservation or you can, they, they might figure out something in the forest that they'd want to concentrate on. So like if they like trees, they can continue with dendrology. They, we all like rocks. So sometimes, you know, they might go into the geology part. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of technicians that have herpetology backgrounds. So we're the crazy people that when you say snake, we're running up and taking pictures and wanting to learn more about it. Um, there's there's whole, all kinds of things that they can learn and they get that connection and mentorship. And the more they're exposed to it and they learn more about it, it's something that they can carry with them. And it's something they're interested in and they can choose to make more and more connections. They can work for the Forest Service, for NRCS, um, we even had a tech who wanted to do conservation photography. So mm. there, there are a lot of opportunities they can learn about just coming out and working with us. 
Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier that there's all kinds of wildlife encounters and and moments uh, in preparation for this conversation. Uh, you and Bill both mentioned the wide variety of tree species that are there, um, uh, hickories and different oaks and so forth. And no offense to trees, but when we talk about wildlife encounters, give us an idea, like you know, an example of a story. What what would people expect? <laughs> okay, um, and it does depend on the season you come out. But uh, one fun story we had last fall when we were training our group is we were sitting there, we were tagging trees in preparation for more research. And we happened to be by a stream bed that only runs ephemerally. And mm -hmm. we had just had some rain, so there were pools in it. And there were frogs actually singing from the pools. Mm -hmm. And so we're enjoying that and we're tagging trees. And all of a sudden, a black racer comes out of nowhere and grabs up one of the frogs. And we're just sitting there watching like, oh my gosh, that just happened, run buddy. <laughs> <laughs> the snake eats the frog and uh, one of our, um, our dendrologists, Helen Check, was on a big boulder and she's a herpetologist. So she was explaining what was going on. Well, we didn't know the snake had actually come up the boulder and she got the cool picture of it just peeking up. <laughs> and it literally slithered beside her to get to her bur to get to its burrow. We didn't know that it was right. She was right there on top of it. But it was wow. a cool moment because you hear all kinds of bad things about snakes, snakes attacking you. It ate and it was just trying to go home. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, and and so, Bill, you know, if you could also give us a sense too of um, some of the specific. Um, things that these students are discovering and that, that, that patience is, is kind of uncovering and how, that, how those discoveries matter there in the, in the forest. Yes, when we started this program with TNC uh, a number of years ago, and the TNC Preserve has been very important to this, uh, we, we, we realized that we needed to understand what was gonna happen to forests as climate changed again. We didn't understand, we still don't know a lot about what causes forests to assemble as they do. Why do certain species, why are rare, so many rare species here? We're, we're finding new species all the time, literally. And, and why, are they, why are they here? Uh, and, and why are they rare? And will they survive? And where will they go? So our forest research is really, I think that's one of the big things, the big practical effects of our forest research is to, is to understand these forests, even understanding what species are. And, uh, and where the ecosystems are going as far as change. So all of that is very, very important. Our research here is, uh, is done in a, a, a pretty unusual way. Every stem, every woody stem bigger than a pencil, uh, one centimeter basically, is, um, is tracked over 150 acres for 50 years. Wow. Uh, an incredible census, 100,000 stems will, will be censused uh, by the time we finish uh, this plot, uh, which we're working on right now. And that's going to tell us a lot about uh, why species are on certain soils. And that's going to help us to understand what's going to happen to forests across North America uh, as climate changes. So it's pretty exciting work. Great, great. Well, um, thank you so much, Bill, and Patience for sharing uh, some of the thoughts about the Paint Forest Research Center, uh, Paint Rock Forest Research Center, and giving us a sense of you know what the what you're doing there on the ground and what the students encounter uh, on a day to day basis when they're doing the field work um, on the site. We want to kind of begin to travel south now uh, in our exploration of Alabama, and as we go south, we're, we're going to talk about some of the efforts to protect sites in 21 counties down in the Alabama River Basin. Now, this is kind of a long journey away from Paint Rock to what is essentially now the Gulf of Mexico um, along the coastal plain. And it includes Blakely Bluff, which is one of the most biologically rich and relatively intact Delta wildernesses in the United States. It's also got historical significance and cultural significance as being a uh, really the bed of the modern civil rights movement, as well as the site of a key final battle of the Civil War. Um, in this area, there are richly forested wetlands, there are prairies. Uh, it's an important incubator um, for life. 
Um, and, you know, as I said before, it's a, a, we, it's a personal connection to the foundation is uh, where Dr. Wilson himself grew up. Um, Bill, can you give us a sense of the Alabama River Basin overall and kind of the projects that are happening there? And then from there, we're gonna go ahead and introduce Philip and talk more about the specific project, the, the very specific project that he's working on uh, in the Alabama River Diversity Network. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Yes, so the Alabama River, the area we're working in to give you a sense of scale and size, it's basically a little bigger than Vermont, bigger than New Jersey. It's a huge area of Alabama in the southeastern part of the state. The Alabama River runs through it. Uh, one of the richest areas for aquatic diversity in, in the temperate world, absolutely incredible. Uh, in, the middle of, uh, in the middle of this Alabama River system, uh, you know, which is 250, 300 miles long in the area we're working, uh, is the center of tree diversity in North America. Absolutely fabulous. And oak diversity is incredibly high there close to 30 species, uh, you know, in, in a very small area. To give you a sense, uh, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, 500,000 acres, has 12 species of oaks. We could find hillsides uh, in South Alabama along the Alabama River where there are 25 or more species. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Center of Magnolia Diversity nationally, center of hickory diversity globally in all likelihood. Uh, just an incredible area with all sorts of terrain, everything from high hills that will just take your breath away in the coastal plain. That's not supposed to happen at the coastal plain to this incredibly broad, rich river delta. And as we talked to Ed about this, as I, as I talked to Ed about it, you know, Ed, Ed I said, there's, a, there's some places in Alabama, I think we can begin to explore what half earth means. And one of those places was the Alabama River Basin. We, we really, there's enough to intact land there. Uh, there's enough biodiversity there to really understand those places was the Alabama Air River Basin. And uh, so it was one of the places where we really wanted to work. But, but the more we looked at it, as always in Alabama, we realized we needed to see it, this diversity through the eyes of diversity, because everywhere we looked, there was this human, uh, there was this uh, compelling human story of what had happened in the basin. This is really where civil rights was forged. Uh, in a remarkable way uh, for some very important reasons that have to do with the landscape and the richness of the landscape. It's no accident that this basin, this area, was home to the two largest cities in North America in 1250 AD. Uh, and it's no accident that the two or three richest counties in 1859 were in this basin. And it's no accident that by 1959, some of the poorest counties uh, in North America were in this basin as well. And I think it all has to do with this relationship with the landscape that we need to understand. There's so many fascinating stories uh, all up and down the river system. I wish I could tell them all. Give me another hour. I'll do that. <laughs> well, but, we have, uh, we but that, that's a good introduction. It's a really important. That point. is a, that is an excellent introduction. And I think one of I think the point that uh, one of the key points that you're making. We but that, that's a good. Yeah, and I think one of the key points that you're making there is that uh, there is a, a a a biological and cultural connection in this region, and and for that let's 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 talk um, a little bit with Philip John, uh, Howard, uh, who is um, going to share with us um, the work he's doing in specific landscapes through the Alabama River Diversity Network, which is a broad coalition of uh, nonprofits, partnerships in local, state, and governments, um, conservation organizations, trusts, uh, heritage preservation groups, all working to tell a richer, broader story there. Philip, if you could uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, this project and the, the role that you've recently undertaken with the Alabama River Diversity Network. Great, Joel, thank you for having me. Um, and um, hello to everyone. Um, really exciting work. Um, we have, of course, as Bill mentioned, um, Alabama is known for a lot of things that I'm learning from Bill. I thought we were just known for football, but obviously we're, we're known for a lot more. And one of the things we're really known for is our history as it relates to civil rights. Um, there were, of course, certain events um, 
happening all over the country and different uh, at different times and periods. Um, but when we look at the modern civil rights movement, we have to seriously look at Alabama. Alabama, by most historians, is considered the birthplace of the modern civil rights movement beginning in 1955 um, with the Montgomery bus boycott um, and the arrest of Rosa Parks and spanning 10 years with the um, uh, climax of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, okay, great. What I was saying was basically Alabama is the birthplace of the modern civil rights movement. Um, it began in the Black Belt region um, with the people of the Black Belt. Um, the, not, and not just I, Dr. King um, began his career in the Black Belt. Um, I like people may think that Dr. King um, chose Alabama, but I like to think Alabama chose Dr. King. Um, and he um, really is known as one of the great leaders in American history. Um, but I think oftentimes we overlook the people who fuel the movement, the people of the Black Belt, the Black farmers of the Black Belt, um, those individuals who oftentimes go unnamed, but their contributions are mighty. Um, and for me, as I began to, was the David Hall Farm, um, the first stop on the Selma Montgomery Trail. Um, the family that owned the property in 1965 still continues to own the property today. Um, the home, as you can see, is not in the best condition, really poor condition. Um, and when we look at the importance um, of what happened at this site, um, this is where um, David Hall, who was a janitor and a farmer, um, overheard um, the planners of the march needing a place to um, stay and offered his property at great price to him and his family. Um, it was so secretive that the marchers were beginning to show up and his family didn't even know um, that they what was going on. They didn't find out until the marcher um, came onto the property. Um, so this campsite and David Hall's contribution to the Voting Rights Act, um, which is probably one of the most significant pieces of legislation in the history of America that really, in my opinion, um, broke the back of Jim Crow and segregation. Um, so when we look at the contributions of this family um, and this home, Dr. King stayed outside of his home in a tractor trailer the only night that he stayed on the march, the morning of March 22nd, he got up, went into this home and had breakfast. Um, and, and, and so with the significance of what the Voting Rights um, Act of 1965 means to America and means to African Americans, um, I think it's imperative um, that we look at how can we save and restore these homes so that future generations can understand what happened there. Um, these places, um, the families I should say, at great cost, um, death threats, retaliation, um, and, and David Hall never got to vote. Um, but his mindset and the mindset of the other campsites were not me, but for my children. And you're looking at inside of um, campsite one, the David Hall farm and the disrepair. Um, the family who owns this property, still the David Hall family, will love to restore these homes and, and make them a center for education, for voting rights and the history of voting rights and the history of the Black Belt, really. This farm um, had been in the family since 1940. Um, and if you can imagine the climate of 1940 and how difficult it must have been for this Black man to um, acquire, I think, over 80 acres of land um, and, and contribute to, um, uh, to his community and to um, his city and, and to raise a family. Um, the Black farmers of the Black Belt um, were instrumental um, when, when others, Black tenant farmers who lived on the farms of white individuals who kicked them off the farms because they were participating in the civil rights movement. It was the Black farmers who stepped in to help those families. Um, so their, their contributions and, and, and their significance is, is, to me, probably understated. Um, saving those farms and saving that those legacies and those stories um, is imperative as we move forward, as we try to find ways um, to uh, heal the racial divide in America. This is a way to do it by making sure we can preserve the stories of the past, 
and allow them to educate us on how to move forward in the future. Thank you, Philip. And it, you know, it seems obvious that there is a deep connection between the African American community in Alabama and the land, and that these farms not only are significant for their history and 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 the culture, but also for the connection and preservation of that of those physical spaces. And in some way, I see a, I don't know, I see a, a connection between. Um, the ability to have these spaces um, and to um, uh, hold on to these spaces uh, as a way of connecting the dots between safeguarding biodiversity and cultural history. Um, in and fact, I, I think, I'm sorry. Go no, go ahead. No, I was going to say um, when Bill mentioned that, um, you know, there's still so much we don't know about the biodiversity in Alabama and the research that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way about the history of, of, of civil rights and um, the history of the Black Belt and the people of that region. There are so many stories that we don't know. Um, there are people who live in the county where these homes are who have never heard of these homes. Um, and so there's a story there that has never been told. The campsites, of course, um, have um, been acknowledged and. Um, throughout time, but the families um, have never told their story. They've never shared what happened and why um, their, their father and grandfather and campsite two was the Rosie Steele farm, a 75 year old grandmother who, who, who took the, the challenge of, of saying, well, knowing that if she were to let the marchers stay on her property, she would be retaliated against, she would receive death threats, she could possibly be killed, but took to have the courage to do that. This is one of the greatest American stories one would ever find, where you have patriots, patriotic Americans saying, dragged America kicking and screaming to that more perfect union. Um, and I, I think their contributions um, is something that I will just, um, to the end of time, fight to make sure that um, their, their story is told, that these homes are preserved, and that, you know, we continue to cherish the history that is here and not lose that. Thank you for that. And, and Bill, you know, what, what role do you envision local governments, you know, the state and even federal government, really, in the long-term protection of these important areas uh, for diversity and biodiversity. Yeah, it's really important to note that uh, we have now legislation in place uh, in Congress that will be uh, be introduced in Congress, well, be introduced in Congress, I think, in the next couple of weeks, that will create a Black Belt National Heritage Area uh, that involves uh, some 20 counties uh, throughout uh, South Alabama. And this heritage area will allow us to explore the history and the biodiversity of the region and link them up uh, throughout the whole Alabama River Basin, uh, virtually uh, north, of, north of Mobile, Mowen County. Incredible effort, something to watch for, something that, uh, something that everyone I think is very excited about because of its great potential. So th there's a big role to be played. And, and as we think about things like 30 for 30, uh, which probably should be, uh, we, should, we should also think of that as a, as a prelude to half earth. Uh, we, are, we should understand that these areas are very important and we need help uh, in preserving them uh, and, in, and in telling their stories. You know, it, it's interesting, if you go back and look at this land, this beautiful prairie that's, that's part of the Black Belt, one of the richest prairie areas in North America, and, and you look at the hickory trees, one of the great centers of, of hickory diversity, and then you look at how did that shape the history of these people? How did it shape what happened here? And this is the incredible story we can tell in this basin. Uh, just, just uh, the Black Panthers were founded very near to where some of these houses uh, were, were built. It's a story we haven't told. It's an incredible story, a remarkable story. And right next door to where the Black Panther Party uh, began and, and began a voting rights effort in Alabama, that's how the Black Panther Party started. Uh, 150 years before that, it was the last stand of American Indian independence in Eastern United States. It began there uh, with a utopian village uh, that was called Ikanochaka, 
uh, right in the middle of these hickory groves, these really important hickory groves on one of the richest stretches of the river where all these fish are moving through. Talk about shad runs, huge, huge numbers of fish moving up and down that river, incredibly important place. And, and, and it all happened there because of that connection to the landscape. Mm, thank you for that. The connections are really palpable and they clearly span uh, centuries, which is really amazing um, to, this, to this day. So we'll go ahead and ask a few more questions. Um, and I've got a question for you, Patience, about your work there um, in Paint Rock. And it's about um, uh, your role there as a mentor to some of those students and your um, understanding of how they, how they work there. Because you said that they, they take a lot away from that experience. As um, uh, some of those students come from Alabama A&M, which is a historically black college and university, um, in particular for African-American students there, encountering wildlife, encountering the outdoors um, and forests. Are there any, um, do, you, do you experience any particular associations that those, that, that those students may have with the outdoors that, or um, preconceptions or even, even hesitancy to, to get, you know, to engage in that site? Or do you think that there's, um, uh, uh, oftentimes an, an existing connection that may happen from their own, from their own relationship with Alabama? Um, I'm not sure it's necessarily a relationship with Alabama as much as uh, maybe a cultural kind of a deal. I know some of the people that are more comfortable in the forest is because they might have hunting backgrounds or they grew up on a farm or something like that. Or, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe they just spent a lot of time outdoors as children, but that is something that has changed. Um, over the decades. And so you have more and more people that stick to urban areas. Mm -hmm. And then you have people like me, I was a military brat. So I never felt a connection to the land until I started doing this kind of research. Mm -hmm. So just getting them that exposure and helping them to understand more. And it's a way to dispel the myths that you hear about the forest and about, you know, some of the dangers there, the wildlife that are misunderstood. So I think just breaking down some of those barriers and educating them is one of the most important things to do to mm -hmm. help them in continuing in this forestry field. Mm -hmm. Great, great, thank you for that. And um, so here's a, another kind of question for, for you, Bill, and also for you, Philip. Could you comment on the role of agriculture? Um, you know, obviously uh, these areas are, are known for their farming there in the Black Belt. And, you know, what could be the role of agriculture, whether it's managed or even on restoration of lands and preserving biodiversity? Um, what are the opportunities that, that might exist there for managing these landscapes to reach their biodiversity goals in balance with, uh, with agriculture? You know, the, uh, the biodiversity of the region is also in the soil in, in huge ways, as it is everywhere, uh, with thousands of creatures. And those thousands of creatures had a special relationship with those unusual black belt soils. Uh, they created, they helped to create this landscape in a very important way. I think we were oblivious to how important those soil creatures were. And so when we plowed it, uh, we, we went through a thousand years of topsoil. Uh, basically every decade uh, for quite a while, and uh, it didn't last. Uh, and so shortly after the Civil War, uh, it launched the Black Belt into a uh, severe poverty, uh, really is the only way to explain it, uh, that, that, that is still lingering, uh, because we don't understand the souls. We still don't understand those souls very well. I think one of the roles that we can play is to understand that Biodiversity exists in the soil as well, uh, as in the landscape itself that once covered that. And to understand how to put those things together uh, as we rethink agriculture in the region. You know, we're always looking for another cotton crop. It's always gonna be, we got a new cotton, we got emus or whatever crazy thing we've got. But, you know, until we begin to understand the biodiversity of that region, I, I think uh, that's gonna be the key to the new agriculture in the Black Belt. And I, and I think having, having small farmers, again, in the Black Belt, the loss of Black farmers in the region has been huge, as it has throughout uh, North America. I, I worked with some, of those, with some of the last Black farmers 
when I was growing up, uh, it's amazing to see how much they knew. They're, they were producing more on their plots than the biggest, wealthiest white farmers around them. It's really phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, but we yeah. systematically eliminated them. And, and Philip, I think you're working with, with farmers too right now. Do you have a, a, a thought or perspective on that? Well, I guess historically, um, the importance of Black farmers has um, really been overlooked. Um, you look at um, Tuskegee and Dr. Booker T. Washington. Um, there's a reason why um, Tuskegee was founded um, in this region and their agricultural history there where Tuskegee trained generations of farmers um, to live off the land. Um, to this day, the families that own the campsites um, associated with the Selma and Montgomery Trail, they're not active farms right now, but they hope um, to become that once again, to kind of be, form themselves into something like a community farm. Um, I've heard stories from the families of um, the campsites where, you know, of course, when they took part in this march, the retaliation um, um, focused on them um, and they were not able to get loans. They were not able to, um, to get things to um, supply their farm, but how the community rallied around them and how um, I think it's not a mistake that the marchers did not stay with doctors, lawyers, um, and other professions on this march. They stayed with black farmers simply because, you know, they believe that black farmers could weather um, this, this onslaught of, of, of death threats and retaliatory measures, and they did. Um, the, the strength of the black farmer has never been more clear than when you look at the fact that the entire um, racist apparatus um, that came down on these families for their participations um, in the march. And here we are 56 years later, and these properties are still owned by the same family. Um, and, and they weathered that storm um, and they're stronger for that. Um, and now I think it's incumbent on us to, 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 to support those families and those campsites to ensure um, that, that, that message of strength and that message of, of, of determination, um, you know, moves forward um, and, and, and is around to teach um, younger generations about um, the importance of black farmers and their contributions, which are many and, and, and really need to be ferreted out even more. Thank you, thank you for that. Okay, so I'd like to kind of turn now to introduce uh, Dr. Paula Ehrlich, who is the CEO and president of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation and the co-founder of the Half Earth Project. Um, and we have a question actually to start off um, for you, Paula, before we kind of have a further conversation. And, and that is about sort of, you know, and I'm paraphrasing one of our panelists here, how do you balance the thinking about the you know, restoration versus some of these root causes of environmental degradation when the problems that we face are you know, so big? Um, and how does the Half Earth Project kind of, kind of fit into that? Hey, thanks, Joel. Um, and thank you very much, Philip and Bill and Patience for your amazing voices today. Um, a, a lot of what fuels what we need to do is exactly what we've been talking about today. Um, not just restoration of a place, but truly understanding it, doing the research, both the cultural research and the scientific research to understand a place well enough to know how to care for it. Um, E.O. Wilson talks about himself as a, as a citizen of the wilderness of the places we've uh, visited and talked about today. He'd say a place exists in the mind and heart as much as in its physical location. And throughout his writing, the places in Alabama that he explored as a boy are part recorded fact, part memory, and part metaphor. They're, as you so have so well said, Philip, sanctuaries of our heritage and also of our heart. Um, and the sort of on the ground scientific research and scholarship that we've been discussing here today adds to our understanding of the beautiful intricacy of special places, um, as Bill has shared. It's, it's both this knowing along with pride of place 
that often fuels conservation success. And it's also important to have a goal, right? Because if you look at history, moonshot goals are the sort of ambition that drives humanity. They, they make our collective imagination explode, the, the sort of challenge that spurs us to greatness. And that's what Half Earth is about, right? Raising our conservation ambition to a new level, protection of half the Earth's land and sea. And if we accomplish this goal, we'll have managed sufficient habitat to safeguard the bulk of biodiversity. And, and this is a big deal, right? It's not just important conceptually, it's important inspirationally. Um, so the big question, of course, is which half? And as we've mapped the species of our planet, the Half Earth Project has identified important priorities for conservation, places for a half Earth future. And you can see these on the Half Earth Project map, places that contain extraordinary biodiversity. And Alabama's places for a half earth future, the Alabama River Basin, the highlands of the Red Hills, the longleaf pine savannas, the, and the Black Belt Prairies are a cornerstone, one of the world's richest regions of aquatic and forest diversity. And as we've gotten a glimpse of today, the work here in Alabama is also a model for how we can best protect these sanctuaries of our transcendent heritage and improve the quality of human life everywhere. And to fuel the stewardship, it's also important that we empower students, as Patience has talked about today, that we empower students to become scientists for a half Earth future, that we enable them to have transformative moments of discovery in nature that empower their life and their career, and that they become leaders and citizens of the wilderness of their place. So we, the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation and the Half Earth Project are very excited about the unique cultural scholarship, research and scientific understanding that's emerging at Paint Rock and through the work of the Alabama River Diversity, not just helping people understand why a place is special and why it should be conserved, but why it's an important part of their life and how they can participate in being part of its protection. Um, in his 2012 book about Mobile and the surrounding environments, E.O. Wilson said, everywhere that children search, there are special places like my own on the shore of Mobile Bay. I know in my heart, we will save them in time. What's happening here in Alabama is the soul of what needs to happen in places for a half earth future everywhere. And I know there are folks on, on this call that are in beautiful places around the world. We, we welcome you and, and everyone to get involved. Thank you so much for that, Paula. And, and, and it's, it's a very elegant and um, uh, beautiful uh, description of, I think, the, the, the call that we all feel um, to conserve these places, um, no matter how we sort of got there. Uh, let me ask you a question. You have been down, uh, well, I shouldn't say down because if you're in Alabama, it's up. You've been to Alabama and you've experienced some of these, um, these beautiful sites. And I think um, you've also gone out there with, with Dr. Finch. Um, you wanna tell us a little bit about an experience that you've had there? Oh my goodness. Well, Yes, Bill and I have had some, <laughs> some wonderful times exploring um, endlessly, if you know Bill, all of the biodiversity um, of, of Alabama. Um, but what always strikes me, uh, especially out in, on the Delta, is the source of serenity uh, as you float out on the water there. The sense that you are in a place that's somehow a national treasure that should already be fully protected. Um, and uh, it's just, just an extraordinary, extraordinary feeling um, uh, to be uh, in not only in a beautiful place, but in a beautiful place that really feels like home. And uh, I, I do hope that we are successful in conserving both the cultural and natural heritage of this super important place. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, we're, 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 we're heading towards the top of the hour now. And um, with our remaining time, I'd like to just take a moment to see if we can ask uh, Philip and Patience 
our guests um, to kind of share their final thoughts or words um, as we uh, sort of weave together um, the, the opportunities that are happening there on the ground in, in Alabama. Um, Philip, why don't you why don't you start if you if you will? Yeah, I, I appreciate it, Joel, and thank um, the E.O. Wilson Foundation for this opportunity. Um, there, there's a story here um, of a, a group of people who probably didn't set out um, to um, change the world. Um, they probably didn't set out to be an example for others to follow. Um, but the result is that that's what happened. Um, the poor people of the Black Belt um, changed America. And by doing so, providing an example for the rest of the world to follow, that if you understand the climate that they were in and the courage and the determination and the sacrifice and the fight that was in those people, you can see the spirit of America in a way that I don't know if we can get anywhere else. They were up against a behemoth in this system of, of racial injustice and discrimination and Jim Crow and segregation. And they came together and they defeated it in a way that allowed for us to move forward as a nation. Um, these people, and their stories and these places is something that if we lose, we lose so much of America. Um, and I am just, I am delighted to have this conversation and, and really to tell the story of these people and to highlight their, their efforts and, and, and to, to share the importance of what they did in hopes of, of really, as we move forward, um, together as we move forward to try to come together as a nation at any point in history, we can always look back at this period and say, this is how it's done. This is how you do this. This is how you come together. Um, these people loved America when America did not love them back. Um, they are some of the most patriotic Americans ever. And they story, their stories deserve to be told and to be highlighted and preserved for generations to come. Um, and, and so I am delighted for this opportunity and, and certainly look forward to the possibilities moving forward. And I'm hopeful um, and, and just extremely excited that we are here, that we are having this conversation. And I hope that um, as we prepare for 60 years in, in 2025 for the Selma to Montgomery March, that we have restored these homes um, and, and restore these, these farms and, and, and really tell the stories that um, can shape and, and help us as we move forward as a nation. So thank you all. And this has been a wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Patience, do you have anything you wanna share? Hard to follow up something like that. But, um... <laughs> it is. I, mean, I mean, my heart, my heart. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> but um, something we didn't get to mention earlier that I would like to point out is Alabama A&M's forest plot here in Sharpingham Nature Preserve is actually part of a bigger network called Forest Geo, the Forest Global Earth Observatory Network mm -hmm. under the Smithsonian Institute. And one of the great things about that is it takes the research to a next level. It's something that they're trying to track for, you know, climate change, long-term forest dynamics. And the fact that it's part of that network, I think gives it a little extra um, importance on a global scale. So that, that's the other really cool aspect of the research in addition to mentoring and educating these uh, new generations of researchers. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you for, 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 for helping it put that in perspective that, it, that this information is has the ability also to change the world. So not only is it the, the actions of the people there, but what we gain from the land in, in preserving that biodiversity as well. Well, I, I want to close up um, this conversation and um, take a moment to say thank you to all of you. 
Thank you, Philip Howard. Thank you, Patience Knight. Thank you, Bill Finch. Thank you, Paula Ehrlich, for your participation in this, this conversation, this panel today. Um, I wanna also take a moment to thank some of the partners in association um, with the work that is being done on all the corners of Alabama, the Nature Conservancy, Alabama A&M, the Paint Rock Forest Research Center, USDA. Um, I wanna thank Ben Rains, author of Saving America's Amazon for the video clip. Um, and then the team behind today's conversation, making it happen on the ground, Marshall Cutchin, Amy Todofsky, Nicole Hans, and Dennis Liu. And then finally, I wanna thank all of you all for tuning in um, and joining us on this conversation. We look forward to having many more as we explore Half Earth Project around the world um, and welcome you to visit www.halfearthproject.org or the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation website to get more information about uh, the work that is happening in Alabama and in many regions beyond. Once again, thank you for participating today and have a great afternoon.